All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be with you on this Saturday morning. Um, it's going to be a beautiful day, and I'm very grateful and thankful that you are here to join us um, for our NAMI Charlotte annual meeting. My name is Ravella Nesbitt. I am the board president um, of NAMI Charlotte. We have a couple of people um, who, are, of course, are on, and we are um, anticipating or um, a lot more folks to join us. Um, but in lieu of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a very full um, agenda for today um, and the hour that we all are together. So again, thank you for being with us uh, for our annual meeting. This is a meeting that we have um, in February of every year to really um, have an opportunity to review our previous year, but also look forward um, into our current year. And so we will be doing that on today. We'll also have an opportunity for, for everyone to meet our, our current and our new board members um, as well. Uh, we'll do a video screening of a uh, publication that we did on um, TD Tardis Dyskinesia. Um, called Understanding the Uncontrolled, a conversation on living with TARDIS dyskinesia. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, for everyone. So that being said, uh, with our power packed hour, we will get started in our presentation. Um, first of all, again, I want to welcome you all to our annual meeting. I wanna talk to you a little bit about NAMI and NAMI Charlotte. Um, NAMI has been in existence for 52 years. Um, it is the largest grassroots organization um, in uh, the country with over 600 um, affiliates and state organizations. Some of the values that NAMI um, centers itself on are hope, inclusion, empowerment, compassion, and fairness. Um, and we here at NAMI uh, do everything we can to ensure that we are a, a, a incorporating all of those important values um, to and with the work that we do. This past year, um, we have had an opportunity to uh, really uh, engage in a bit of a transition. Um, as many of you have experienced and lived through COVID, from 2020, um, even in some circumstances, we're still living in um, um, and with COVID. Um, during that uh, time frame, uh, you may notice that our programming was limited to virtual programming. We scaled back on a number of programs, and the programs that we did offer were virtual. Um, this past year. Um, in 2022, we had the opportunity to be able to relaunch um, programs in person, um, programs, classes, support groups, et cetera. So we moved from our virtual platform back to an in-person um, platform. So this was a bit of a transition for us because as you know, what everyone mostly had experienced prior to COVID, not just in the mental health uh, industry, but other industries as well, we had to really think about and consider what's the best approach for us um, post-COVID um, or after uh, COVID has affected all of our lives. So this past fall, we relaunched in-person classes and support groups. Uh, we be began um, engaging our volunteers. Uh, we relaunched Providence Place, which is a drop-in environment of creative activities. Um, to engage people with lived experience. We continue to support CIT through partnership with Mecklenburg County. Um, and with NAMI Walks, we raised over $33,000 um, in uh, last year for NAMI Walks. And so overall, it has been um, a really good year. The impact report that you see before you shows um, some of our attendance, um, in our community presentations, our classes, our uh, social reach, our volunteer hours, 
our NAMI walk participants um, and our health helpline uh, calls that we have received in addition to the number of sessions and participants we've had in our support groups, our involvement with crisis intervention, training, um, and Providence plays as mentioned before. So overall, it was a really good year. So as we think about moving forward um, into 2023, there are a lot of different areas in which we are intently focused on. And so I'm gonna take some time to review those different areas, just so you can get an idea of uh, where NAMI is and where NAMI is going uh, for, our next, for this year um, and in years to come. We do intend to and are increasing our access and quantity of our current education and support groups. Um, some of the education and support groups that we have are Ending the Silence Family Support Group, um, Connections Recovery Group, Family to Family, Sharing Hope, Providence Place, and CIT, um, as mentioned um, before. Um, and of, like I also mentioned, we did a lot uh, or we did several different programs virtually um, and some we weren't able to do virtually, but now we've relaunched several of those programs to be um, in, per in person. So not only are we looking to increase the quantity of our programming, um, we are also looking to increase the accessibility um, of that program um, and and by ensuring that we're partnering with different organizations across the city to host different programs. This will also allow access um, to individuals from around our city um, to, to the different types of programming that we do have. So we're really excited not only to be relaunching programs, but to increase the access to those programs um, as well. And I will say that we've had um, a really good um, demand for a variety of different programs. Um, and so we, we uh, anticipate that demand will um, increase. We're also um, introducing some new programs and these are not new programs to NAMI um, as a whole, but newer programs to um, NAMI Charlotte. And those are NAMI on campus, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, and family and friends. So just to tell you a little bit about peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer um, is an eight session education program, which is taught by trained leaders with lived experiences. And that includes activities, discussions for adults um, with mental health conditions. We're also looking to launch Family and Friends, which is a four hour seminar that informs and supports people who have loved ones with mental health conditions. And of course, NAMI on campus. Um, and this is a program that provides students with a peer run mental health organization on campus. It supports fellow students. It raises mental health awareness and educates the campus uh, community. So those are some programs that we're looking to introduce um, and really ingrain ourselves into the Charlotte community with. We're also looking to continue to maintain and strengthen our community relationships um, so that we can influence um, increased access, quality, and improvement of mental health care in our community. I think it goes without saying that mental health um, has become a greater conversation um, piece within many organizations and within the community as a whole. And so we recognize that. And so we want to be able to look at the relationships that we do currently have um, and look at relationships in which we can build in order to expand the education, knowledge, and information about mental health uh, within our community. We're also looking to continue to increase our membership and our volunteer um, engagement. Um, and through our awareness, um, as we are able to uh, strengthen our relationships in, our com in the community, um, through that awareness, we are hoping and intending that our membership and our volunteer engagement will increase as well. We recognize that many people have passions um, around mental health and that we um, want to be able to engage folks who are passionate about this topic and passionate about this subject. 
Um, and this gives people a platform to be able to engage in mental health education um, and advocacy. So we're looking um, and are increasing our membership and our volunteer engagement. We're also looking to develop and implement a sustainable strategic plan. Our uh, board of directors, we recognize that we're in a position where the need for mental health support and education is increasing. Um, Charlotte is growing um, and we wanna, be, we wanna spend significant time in the first and second quarter of this year developing a strategic plan that will be focused on implementing it um, in the years to come. So this is something that's very critical um, for our organization. Um, we see that this is an opportunity um, to really expand not just programming, but just being able to expand our organization as a whole, um, because the more we expand our organization, the more people we can reach, the more programming that we're able to be, um, be able to offer. And coupled with the increase of uh, mental health um, challenges in our community and in, in, in communities across the country, we wanna be able to meet those needs for those who desire it. Also part of our strategic plan will be significantly increasing our fundraising efforts to meet the growing needs of our local community. So in order to provide and do the programming that we desire um, and to expand the organization in the way that we um, hope to be able to expand it, we do need to increase our fundraising efforts in order to meet our need. Our strategic planning process will help us with that, along with our relationships um, and strengthening and, and maintaining um, our current relationships and community partnerships that we do have. To help us accomplish these goals, I want to introduce you to um, our uh, current board members and our newer board members um, as well. And I think most of the board members are on our call today. Um, so I will introduce them. And as you see them, you wanna put in the chat, hello, congratulations, all of those wonderful accolades. Um, that we want to be able to give our volunteer board of directors um, as well. As I mentioned, I'm Ravella Nesbitt. I am the board um, president. Uh, we have on our uh, current board, and then I'm gonna move to our newer board members, Grace Smith, who is our secretary and she is over membership. We have Bob Evans, um, who is our Providence Place coordinator, Dr. Larry Jones, who is our Ending the Silence Coordinator, Ron Clark, um, who is our Recovery Support Group Facilitator, Dr. Heather Manos, um, and Christine Zazario, who is our CIT Coordinator. Now our newer board members, and these are board members who've been added um, in 2022, are Kate Weaver, she's our Vice President, um, and Kate holds many hats, including pro program coordinator. She's also been organizing our outreach efforts um, as well. We have Shane Gray, who is our treasurer. We also have Ashley Peterson, who is our communications coordinator. We have Jessica White, who is our NAMI walks coordinator, and Christopher Whedon, who is our NAMI on campus. Um, coordinator. So please join me um, in uh, welcoming back our, our um, board members from previous and welcoming our new board members that have joined us um, in the latter part of 2022. We're really excited about the skill and expertise that's reflected on our board and we are um, super hopeful, um, excited, ready to dive into our goals for 2023 with our board members. I'm excited that they come with so many different skills and so much expertise. Um, and I, I really feel super, super good and super excited about where we're going um, as a board. In addition to that, um, there are individuals who are coordinators of different areas um, that are not on our board that um, I do want to recognize um, as well. 
And these um, individuals are leading various efforts um, across the organization. Um, and we intend that um, this list will increase even more. Um, and that is Donna Hairston, who is our helpline coordinator. If you've called our phone number, um, you may have received um, or heard her on the other line um, when you've called. And so we appreciate all the work and efforts that she's done. Kathleen Clark is our volunteer coordinator. And Kathleen um, is newer to NAMI and we are super excited to be able to have her to um, coordinate all of the efforts around um, volunteer volunteerism. Um, and she has a team um, as well that works very closely with her. Joyce Eagleman, who is our CIT um, liaison. Um, Joyce has been with us for quite some time, but she is a vital part of our partnership with CIT um, and being able to have NAMI represented um, at the CIT trainings um, that are offered across the county. Margaret Butler is our Novant um, Outreach um, Coordinator. Um, again, another opportunity for partnership. Um, and we're really excited about being able to offer um, uh, outreach efforts um, with our hospitals um, as well. Zene Wilson is our virtual assistant and she is the one that's uh, that's been behind the scenes with us for a couple years and really um, allowing us to uh, move the organization forward and allowing us to be able to meet all of the various demands um, that we have um, as an affiliate. So please join me in welcoming and uh, thanking our uh, 2023 coordinators that we have to date. Again, I'm looking forward that we will have even more individuals who will be coordinating various um, parts of uh, the work that we do here at NAMI Charlotte. So kudos to, to our board members and to our coordinators. So I want to have an opportunity to introduce um, a, a production, a video that uh, we did just a couple months ago. Um, in fall of 2022, we received a grant from Neurocrine Biosciences and NAMI National to provide education on TARDA dyskinesia. Um, so through, this, through the leadership of Bob Evans and Christine Zazaria, who are on our board, uh, we partner with Atrium Health to produce an educational video on TD. The video is about 17 minutes long, and so you all get the pleasure of being able to preview this video, which I think is wonderful. Um, and um, it's also on our website. And you can also find additional TD resources on our website um, as well. So get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea get something to drink. We're going to spend about 17 minutes previewing um, our video and we'll, I'll join you on the other side. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today in our conversation about TARDA dyskinesia. Um, I thought we would start off by just introducing ourselves and um, telling everybody at home why we're here today and maybe what connection we have to the topic. Uh, we start with Tasha. Um, I'm Tasha Jordan and I'm a nurse here at Behavior Health um, with Atrium and I serve on our ad team and I serve a client that has this. Hi, my name is Barton Anus. And I'm a peer support specialist. I'm also a member of NAMI Charlotte. Um, I also have my own nonprofit organization entitled Solid Sheet, which is dedicated to women and teenage girls who have mental health conditions. We run support groups, we do nature walks, we do horseback riding, and we do events around Charlotte to kind of get people out of isolation. I've also published my first journal. It's a journal dedicated to individuals who have bipolar disorder. James Rochelle, the medical director for Behavioral Health Charlotte. I'm also the chair for the academic department for Wake Forest. I treated uh, many patients with tardive dyskinesia in the past 
I'm Alf Smith, done retired from the New York City Police Department. I am a uh, member of NAMI. I'm an instructor for NAMI Family, Family, NAMI Basics, and a lot of other NAMI programs. I also do support groups. And the reason I'm on the panel is I have a loved one who suffered with a tired dyskinesia. Hello, my name is Kate Weaver, and I have several family members who struggle with mental illness, um, bipolar, and anxiety. I am become an advocate for mental health and am now on the board of directors for NAMI and also an instructor for Family to Family, which is one of our signature programs. And I also run a support group for family. And I'm Christine Cesaro, and I will act as your moderator today. Um, my connection is that I am also on the NAMI Charlotte Board of Directors, and I'm the facility executive for Behavioral Health Charlotte with HM Health. Um, so, Dr. Rochelle, I think it's probably best that we start with you, and I'm hoping that um, you can explain a little bit about tardive dyskinesia. It's hard to say. It's certainly hard to understand. And so um, that's why we're here today. We want to kind of put some education out there. So can you talk a little bit about um, what tardive dyskinesia is? Sure. Tardive dyskinesia is a movement disorder. It's typically associated with antipsychotics, so occasionally not. Um, it tends to affect women more than men, and as we get older, it, it tends to affect the blood they age if they're on you know, psychotics for a long period of time. It has to do with the mechanism with which that the antipsychotics you know, work. Um, they block dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in your brain, and it's something that helps with movement. And well, because they block the receptors, we see more. We see more of that neurotransmitter in the brain, which causes people to have some of these abnormal movements. Uh, a lot of times these movements tend to be in a, a, one particular part of the body. Sometimes it's in the eyes, in the, the tongue, um, sometimes in the hands or the feet. And there are random um, movements that occur. They increase when a person is under stress, um, but they can be pretty um, frustrating for the person that has those movements. Um, a lot of times it can be even embarrassing for that person, even if it's something they cannot control. We do have treat treatments, fortunately, for this. There are some medications that have come out recently on the market that help. There's also certain uh, medications that we use to treat psychosis that we can switch people to that can help decrease some of these movements. So there are some treatments out for it as well. So, Dr. Shaw, uh, we have a psychiatric emergency room here. Sometimes people will come in in crisis and they have um, feelings of locked jaw or thick tongue. Is that different or similar to tardive dyskinesia? It, it is similar in the fact that it, the causes are similar to why people are experiencing them, but they are, in fact, completely different uh, movement disorders. What you're describing is, is an acute dystonic reaction. Um, and so we can fortunately relieve those very quickly with medication. And once we relieve the, those, those movement disorders, it, they go away um, unless the person is, is, receives, again, a, a certain medication that may bring those back. But again, we can't really those. Typically, then we stay away from medications, particular medications that may cause those movement disorders. As you mentioned, tardive dyskinesia can be somewhat embarrassing. Um, and we all know that when you have a diagnosis of a mental illness, it can inhibit you socially. You, you become leery of going out in public and with friends and um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe your individual experiences with your um, patients or family members that have experienced this and maybe how it's affected them. Do you want to start, Tasha, talking about your patient? Sure. I have a client and um, his symptom was more muscle spasms. They kind of, the head were kind of locked to one side. And oh, as you mentioned, that's embarrassed. that was embarrassing for him. He was very social and he had become withdrawn because of this. Um, he actually started receiving some injection, bulk up injection, would help, which helped loosen up that muscle for him. Um, and it, he still has it, but it's much more manageable. And for my daughter, um, she was uh, diagnosed at 16. So when they first started or one on different medications, she was having uh, a twitching of the mouth and uh, tremors in her hand. Um, after she was stabilized for a while, uh, she had another episode. And after that episode, with new medications, she started to have different, you know, uh, ton dyskinesia uh, things. She was having uh, more pronounced twitching. Uh, the tremors got stronger. And uh, then she even developed a twitch in her leg. And so uh, 
they tried to uh, make changes to the medication. She was even, I skipped this part, she was even uh, having trouble swallowing it. So they have to take one medication away because you, you have to be able to swallow, not tell if you try to eat or drink. So they removed that medication and tried others. And so um, today, with the reduction of some medications, we've seen the symptoms less than like the, the leg twitch is completely gone. But she still had the tremors of the hands. But it's it's balancing, you know, hallucinations or some hand tremors. I mean, right. And how old is she now? She's 28. Okay, so she's been dealing with that for quite a while. And did, have you seen that it has um, caused her to be more isolated, uh, isolative? And well, it, it's hard to say if, if it's that or just the she hasn't had to say if any of us dealing with it. And she has isolated more. She mostly only deals with family. She doesn't really uh, deal with too many friends. Um, Barjan, I, I wanted to ask you specifically about education. What what education would be helpful for families who are going through this? Um, or really with any kind of symptoms or side effects from medication, what do you, um, what kind of advice do you give folks when you're talking to them? I honestly believe that um, asking questions, asking the right questions would be helpful. I know for me, a lot of times when I meet with my psychiatrist and she's prescribing medication, I don't always ask questions. I don't ask what the side effects are. I kind of just trust her judgment. And sometimes when my medication isn't working correctly, or I feel it's not working correctly, she'll just change my medication, you know, and there's really no conversation about, well, what were your symptoms? Did it make you feel better um, or anything like that? So I, I honestly believe asking questions, doing your own research, and just talking to people about the medication and not just trust what the psychiatrist is prescribing you. Like, I, I really do think you need to do your research and ask those questions. And Dr. Sean, you could probably speak from the psychiatrist perspective. I think everyone's open to that. I mean, certainly, I, I think, first of all, I, I would love to prescribe from a, the psychiatrist or the private uh, nurse practitioner that's working with patients that we do go over all side effects with patients and, and also explain what to look for. Um, what, what do some of these side effects look like if you were to experience them? Um, and then have a discussion whether or not um, the person that's going to be taking the medication feels comfortable or not, and then what are the alternatives. So hopefully it's a, it's a broader dis uh, discussion when you are talking with your provider and, and the providers initiating a lot of that. Having said that, it is also very important, as you've discussed from a patient standpoint, to make sure you're as educated as you can be um, going to um, sites, you know, certainly looking at, you go to the, the pharmaceutical sites and look at what those side effects are to described on those sites um, and um, talking with other people that have experienced those medications as well. But certainly being as informed as you can before you go to see your physician or nurse practitioner so that you can um, make sure that you have, the, you have information um, of your own are able to ask questions that you might not otherwise uh, think about, think of if you have not had that uh, education you feel on your own. Natasha, so, you you probably interact with patients a lot more than the physician gets a chance to. Do you find that you have to provide a lot of education and about what to look out for or what medications are dealing with? Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of times you, our patients trust what the provider is prescribing and then um, that afterward, they might ask <laughs> the questions about I have still ask me about how can I think about I have to, yeah and so and so yes um, there's a lot of education we provide because a lot of our clients are on antipsychotic medic medication and are at greater risk for you know TD so yeah we provide provide a lot of education thank you too great um, Kate this question's for you um, research shows that care partners often neglect their own health due to the challenge of caring for others. Um, how do you take care of yourself and what advice would you give to others who are also caring for somebody with an illness? That's a great question. I think first, it's important for caregivers to acknowledge how difficult it can be to be the first line of um, advocacy for your loved one. And second, then find ways to become educated and supported. And so through NAMI, we have a class called Family to Family and it's an eight week class for families who have had a loved one struggling with mental illness. And we cover everything from 
different kinds of medications and side effects and how medications work within the brain, but also how to um, talk to someone who's mentally or who has emotional dysregulation and how to find resources and support. And so as parents go through, loved ones go through this class, they're able to then become more educated and advocate for their loved one. And oftentimes the caregiver is the first person to notice that something might be um, awry, going awry with their loved one. So that's really important. And then we also offer support groups. And so oftentimes in these support groups, people find community. Um, we're not suffering alone. We can be with other people in community. And the shared wisdom can be really incredible. Uh, many times people are talking about different pet medications and how it has impacted their loved ones. And that knowledge, I think, is powerful. Right. And that could be kind of a social interaction or maybe make people more comfortable to be in a group environment if other people have similar side effects or similar situations that they've gone through. Do you find that that happens? Exactly. It happens all the time. Yeah. We also cover self-care in, um, in that clown, but there's a whole portion of the class that covers self-care taking care of yourself, making sure that you're strong, like in um, the hairline, they say, put your mask on first before you aid somebody else. Right. So just using that that analogy, you have to be strong in order to help your loved one. So Al, you know, thinking back to when your daughter was first diagnosed, how hard was that for you to realize that in order to best help her, you had to take care of yourself more, or educate yourself more, especially because she's 16 and so young. A benefit that I add is my wife, we have been. Okay. <laughs> so my wife found out yeah. by reading. And so that gave us an avenue to go. We went to a meeting and we saw, we said, wow, this is great. And because of that, we ended up not only uh, taking the classes and learning for ourselves, we became instructors of family to family. We also are instructors for NAMI basics, which deals with juveniles that are dealing with uh, mental illness. And um, so we just got so much from NAMI that uh, helped us to learn all of the aspects. And each time we teach the class, it's like we learn it again. So it's, it's awesome. So, you know, the, one of the statistics that I read are that 25% of patients who are um, on antipsychotics have these sorts of side effects. Um, but we found it very difficult to find somebody with lived experience or who with had tardive dyskinesia to come and talk in this forum. And I can only think that that's because of um, the embarrassment, um, but maybe also just um, a lack of education and not knowing how it would be helpful to share to others. So uh, how can we as a as an organization with NAMI as a hospital um, encourage people to talk more about the symptoms they're experiencing? Because I think obviously people just start talking about it. We started a support group for um, peers and it's grown over the past few months. We just started it in August and we're finding that that community is becoming stronger and stronger. And I know that the topics that they talk about, you know, we get a report after each meeting that um, they're getting deeper and deeper. So I hope that that kind of community allows people to share on the high space and it's very safe space. That's important. Key. I think the more we talk about it, whether it's places like this or, uh, you know, whether it's the provider talking to patients or Whatever, wherever else we can get information out, support groups, things like that, the less stigmatizing it becomes. Because the thing I, I think COVID taught us about behavioral health is once COVID came, everybody was talking about behavioral health. Everybody was experiencing it. So it became less taboo. Um, Tart of this niche is, 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 is a, it's a piece of that. And so how do we get more people talking about it and, and exposing people that this is a real thing? Um, there are there, There's help for it. But it, it is something that people suffer with. It's not something that necessarily, while well, you, you may feel embarrassing, it's not something that should be embarrassing for people. I agree. And I think um, sometimes I don't, I think some of my patients didn't even realize they had that. They just thought, it. so just talking about it more um, to help, you know, people understand that this is not just a particular side of the to this medicine or to whatever you think it is, that this is a disorder that you know can be treated. So maybe even 
caregivers or professionals that are working with patients, just even to identify, I see that you're, you have these movements. How long have you had that? Why don't we go talk to the doctor about that? And a lot of people could be suffering in silence right. and not even realize that there are options out there. And I would add um, peer support in there. I think people are more willing to speak about their experiences with other people who have been there and know what something feels like. So I think peer support, um, putting that on the table, a discussion for, you know, our peer supporters to start that conversation. Yeah, great, great idea. Okay, well, I really appreciate everybody coming today and participating in this conversation. I think it's been very helpful and I look forward to being able to share this with the community and um, really uh, hopefully help some folks get the care they need. Again, I want to thank Bob Evans, Christina, Christine Zazario, Kate, and the others, um, and in addition to Atrium Health, for um, having the opportunity to, to publish this um, video. It can be found on our website if you would like to share it or view it. Um, again, I think it's such a, a valuable resource. Um, and um, we are happy to be able to not just have the video, but also be able to have additional resources on our website as well. I just want to share a couple additional things with you, and then we're going to open up um, for questions. Um, so first of all, I wanted to share our February upcoming um, events. So we have a couple of events that are coming up in, in February specifically. Uh, one is um, a save the date. Uh, we will be doing a, uh, a, a training um, presentation um, in reference to sharing hope. Um, and the conversation will be around black men um, and depression. This will be in um, honor of Black History Month. That's gonna be on February 24th from 11.30 to one o'clock. Uh, we've had the opportunity to be able to partner with Harmony Recovery Group, um, and we will also provide lunch. So look for the registration, um, we'll be opening up soon. Um, in reference to that, we'll have a panel um, of Black men who will talk about Black men um, and depression. So we're really excited about that. We're also really excited about next Saturday, from 10 until 11, we have a volunteer meetup. So it is an opportunity for you, if you're not a NAMI volunteer currently, or someone you know, even if you're a volunteer, maybe you can bring someone um, to the volunteer meetup. This is being led by Kathleen Clark and her team. Um, it will be at South Park Regional Library from 10 until 11. On next Saturday, we'll have light refreshments you'll get a chance to really learn about all the different volunteer opportunities um, that we have here at NAMI Charlotte. Um, you do have to RSVP, so that also can be found on our website um, as well. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you um, at one or both of these events. Also, I would encourage you to stay connected with us on our website, um, on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, um, YouTube as well. Um, we post enormous amount of um, content there. Um, that's where you can find out all the upcoming um, events and programming um, that we have. If you have any questions, you can also reach out to us via email um, and um, phone um, as well. So that really concludes my part of the presentation. Um, we are now going to have an opportunity to have any uh, questions. 
um, that you may have. Um, I will also invite our board members to um, unmute if there are some questions that maybe they can answer um, if we have individuals who have questions or comments that you have, uh, but that is uh, the conclusion of the formal part of the presentation. So I'll open it up for questions. Hi, um, my name is Kim Yarborough. I um, moved here from Florida where I was active with the NAMI uh, group in Florida. I wanted to find out how I can get involved and what are the opportunities to get involved in NAMI here. I did attend the NAMI walk um, that happened in Charlotte last year. I think it was October, November timeframe. Um, and that was fantastic to meet people, but I wanna get more involved and I wanted to understand the opportunities to do so. I will not be able to meet with uh, you guys on Saturday next week. I have a previous engagement already. Okay. Over. Okay. All right. So there are many, many opportunities. If we can get your contact information, that will allow um, our volunteer person, our volunteer coordinator to reach out to you um, and to talk more specifically about what areas that you're interested in and uh, what areas um, that are available. We have a range of different opportunities from um, facilitating classes and support groups to volunteering to be on several different um, committees. Um, so we have lots of great opportunities. We also have opportunities in which uh, we need folks to be able to lead various efforts um, as well. So thank you so much and um, I'll definitely provide the information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Did you enjoy the video? Yes, it was very enlightening. Great, great. All right, I'm going to open up the chat. I see some messages coming through in the chat here. Miss Griffin, you're interested as well. Um, are you going to be able to be at the uh, volunteer meetup? Um, if not, if you could share your information, if you feel comfortable sharing it in the chat, if not, you can also email us. Okay, I'll I'll put it in the chat. No, I'm not able to make it next week either. Um, I have something that starts at 11, so I wouldn't be able to make the transfer from one place to the other. Okay, but no I will put the information in. Okay, that that would be great. And again, we have lots of different opportunities um, in which uh, we do need volunteers. So we're would be very interested to hear all of the different areas in which you bring your expertise to the okay, table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other any other thoughts? Um, any thoughts or comments from our board members? I'm going to invite you into the conversation. We have several board members on today. Anything from our board members that you would want to add as far as what we're looking forward to um, in the new year? Um, any comments about programming, classes, support groups? Etc. So I want to invite our board members to chime in. Hi, Ravella. It's Christine. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm I'm excited to hear about um, folks that want to come and volunteer with us that have volunteered in other areas because I think that it helps to bring a, a great new perspective and. And I know I can probably speak for you and that we would love to learn about what other um, NAMIs and other areas. Um, have found to be successful in regards to reaching out and within their community or events that they've put on. So I look forward to um, those folks sharing that with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we really are. Thank you, Christine, for that. We really, we just, and, and I've alluded to it definitely in the presentation, but we really have, have found ourselves at a, at a very, um, unique and opportune space in that 
there is such an increased awareness around mental health conditions. Charlotte is growing. Um, there uh, has been a, a substantial increase in anxiety and depression of, over the last couple of years. People are having more conversations about mental health conditions. Um, stigma, you know, we're constantly battling uh, working to diminish the stigma around mental health conditions. So we find ourselves in really a unique um, place and position. And we see the need and we want to grow with the need. Um, and so we are doing lots of things that you won't see. Um, we're doing a lot of things behind the scenes to ensure that we are developing as a sustainable um, organization. And so really, really looking forward to partnering and having folks walk alongside us um, in this really, really exciting time. Hello, this is uh, Larry Jones. I'm you know, another board member. And again, I'm too very excited to see the interest in our programs. And of course, we definitely encourage more uh, volunteers, those that are with us, or if you know other people who have similar interests, to encourage them to join NAMI so that they can participate in some of these programs and provide assistance to uh, the Charlotte community in areas where they are grossly underserved in most, most areas of the city. So again, we thank you all for, for being here and expressing your interest in uh, NAMI Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Hi, hey, Ravella, it's Shane. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I think, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about in this coming year is, um, for me especially, is a passion of developing relationships with other organizations that can help us further spread what NAMI has to offer and what is available to to persons who are living with mental illness or those that are caregivers for those with mental illness. Um, you know, there's not a lot of big partnerships right now. So how can we better partner with healthcare organizations? How can we partner with faith-based organizations? How can we partner with other nonprofit agencies who work with people that are touched in some ways by mental illness in order to have areas across the entire Charlotte region, right, that are partnered with us uh, in this mission. It's a huge area that's covered by NAMI Charlotte. So if you've got one place in South Charlotte that's willing to give you space to hold a family to family class or to hold a peer to peer class, but I have someone in Huntersville, that's a long way, that's a long drive to do that. So how can we have these partnerships spanning the entire Charlotte region? So love that all of you are on the phone. And if you have ideas about how we can um, how we can do that, places we might reach out to that would be open to those partnerships, would love, would love to hear that so we can start having some conversations and some meetings. Thank you, Shane. Um, Alita had a, a question and also a comment. She had a question about is TD reversible? Um, and I think it's on a case by case uh, basis. I think there has not been as much research um, on TD um, to know that if in every case it's reversible. Um, so I think right now what the research says mostly is that it's on a case by case uh, basis. It can be reversed. It can be reversed. I'm not sure of all the um, the the circumstances and and the environment in which that happens. Um, but um, it is on a case-by-case -case basis, as far as my understanding of that. Now, there may be others who might be a little more informed on that. Wyona, I see your hand raised. Hi, I'm not informed on that specifically. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I've, my hand. I've, I've been trying to raise my hand for the last five minutes. I couldn't oh, figure it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wanted to jump on here and say, I uh, I think I found my tribe. <laughs> Yay! Are we your tribe? 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, we your tribe. I'm so happy. I'm excited. So uh, just to tell you a little bit, I am the daughter of a mother who um, challenged, who was mental, uh, diagnosed with mental illness when I was a little girl at eight years old. And I am the mother of a son who attempted suicide back in 2018. So uh, along with the lines of my mother um, in her mental illness and challenges, she attempted suicide, of course, several times throughout our lifetime. So I have a lot of experience in that. Uh, ergo, the reason why I uh, developed my foundation called Mothers of African American male millennials or African A A M M. And yes, we're definitely looking for space. Uh, I was trying to uh, catch Mr. Shea. Was it Shea or? Um, right. Yes, uh, because we're definitely looking for space to hold um, just a support for the mothers who have experienced their son's uh, suicide or attempt of suicide, and we support one another in our uh, experiences, as well as our mission being to break the stigma of suicide in the African American community. So I just wanted to uh, say hello to everyone and uh, hopefully you'll be seeing me at some of the events and yes I will make the event next week. Awesome awesome thank you I love it when um, when folks say they found their tribe so <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm very happy well, yeah. glad we could be a part of that. I appreciate you all. We look forward to connecting with you um, even more. Yes. Uh, absolutely, even more. Thank you also, Alita, for saying in the chat about partnering with the VA um, and someone to address homelessness um, as well. And I think, again, as we grow our organization, um, as we um, expand, um, because we all are volunteers. And so um, as we grow our organization and take it to the next level, um, we are looking to even increase our partnership um, even more as well. All right, any other comments? Any other comments from our board members? or our coordinators. I see we have a couple of coordinators on. Joyce, is there any, I know I'm calling you out, Joyce. Is there anything that you wanna add around CIT? That's an important program that we have as well, or that we partner with Mecklenburg County on. Jess, I saw you come off mute and I think you went back on mute. Okay. Rahela, if she's having audio problems, I can I can share that certainly if anyone has lived experience and they have an interest in possibly participating in our panel discussion that we help to set up for the CIT um, classes, they can certainly reach out to me or to Joyce and we can um, meet up and talk more about what that entails um, and, and see if that's a good fit for them. Awesome. Awesome, very good. May I ask a question, Christine? What do you mean by having a lived experience by interacting with them on behalf of a loved one or being a person who was actually handled by them. I had to have some trouble getting off mute too. So, you know, CIT um, classes that we help support um, are for police officers. We've done some for security guards and for 911 operators. So, I, you know, I think we're interested in both. Um, if you have some experience related to maybe an interaction with yourself or with a loved one with the police specifically. I think that that's very powerful as a story to tell um, so that, you know, it gives, it really breathes life 
into the scenario, I think, for the officers. And that's really what we want to do is to, um, to help them to um, empathize and see what that experience is like for families or for folks um, who are suffering from illness um, and, and who, who end up interacting with the police in some way. Okay, and you said reach out to you? Yep, you can reach out to me and um, I can, Joyce and I can connect with you and kind of talk through more um, about it. Um, okay. We will love that. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. What was your name again? I'm Helen Griffith. Okay, thanks Helen. Mm -hmm. I put my contact information in the chat, so. Perfect. All right, awesome. So uh, Kim, the location for the training on the 24th is going to be at Harmony Recovery Group, and they are at 11403 North Tryon Street. And we'll have more information on our website, in our newsletters, et cetera, um, on that as we um, uh, firm up all of the details over the next couple days to a week. So we'll have more of that. All right. OK, well. This has been wonderful to spend um, your Saturday morning uh, with you and together to talk about NAMI. Uh, I think something that we all are very passionate about. Um, and if we weren't, we weren't be here. We wouldn't be here. So um, thank you all for all that I know that you've already done, all that you will continue to do in support of NAMI Charlotte. Um, I um, invite you in to allow NAMI Charlotte uh, to be a part of your lives and that this will be um, a banner year for us. So we're looking forward to a lot of exciting things this year. So if there are no other questions or comments, we are going to end our time together. Again, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing those of you who will be in attendance on the 24th and next Saturday. Um, and those of you who have put your contact information in the chat, we will be in contact with you to connect you. Um, and so as uh, in the words of Wyona, welcome to the tribe. Have a great day. <laughs>